everybody. Uh, my name is Cody. I haven't really introduced myself yet on this channel. Um, I own Trinity Fabworks LLC. It's a tiny, tiny little LLC that I just do on the side out of a two-car garage uh, in Michigan. And um, I do general fab work and uh, some work on heavy equipment and uh, some off-road toys, um, as well as some other prototype work that I do here and there. So. Um, I just want to show you this press brake that I built a couple of years ago. I'm just about to sell it and I've wanted to do a video on it for a couple of years now and I just never have. Uh, I just purchased an Amata, um, which is a CNC press brake, and so it's time for me to sell this one, but I wanted to make sure I documented um, you know, some things about this before I actually pushed it out the door. Uh, I built this a few years back. It's a you know, 40 inches across for, for bend length there, you can bend 40 inches of material at a time, which is a weird size, but that was due to the material that I already had on hand. This was kind of pieced together over the course of a couple of years. Um, this up here is a hydraulic ram off of an old cap, uh, I don't know if it was off of a um, skid steer or what it was off, I think it, I can't remember what piece of equipment that was off of, but uh, my uncle gave me that, he had that laying around. Um, I've got a, an electric hydraulic unit from an automotive vehicle lift, okay, from a hoist um, that's powering this. And then, uh, you know, I've got some other things here that uh, will re most of it was repurposed. So all the heavy um, I-beam and uh, heavy wall tubing that this is built out of uh, was mostly repurposed materials that I bought for a really good deal which is kind of what pushed the design forward on why it looks the way it does. Um, it's not your typical appearance of a press brake, and that was due to the material that I had on hand. I wanted, you know, it was right when I was starting up, and funds were really limited, but I wanted something to be able to bend materials so that I was you know, welding less, um, and just to give a more clean, uniform look on some of the parts that I was producing. And honestly, it's opened up a lot of doors for me. Um, having a press brake has been really nice. Now it's not a CNC, um, but it does have a back gauge that's controlled by a stepper motor, and um, the depth on it is, uh, you can set the depth. It, it works kind of like a manual version of a Bailey or Tommy industrial brake, one of those entry level NC style press brakes. Um, it's kind of in between, between the Bailey and the Tommy and the Swag Off-Road. So, uh, those presses that are about 15 grand or the ones that you can build from Swag Off-Road, this is kind of an in-between. Um, it's just, it was something I needed, uh, and so I built what I needed with the available funds and tools that I had at the time. And uh, it's worked really good for me for the past couple of years. I built a back gauge for it, and then I didn't like how the back gauge was set up, and so I took the fingers and everything off of that, and I never replaced them. Uh, I've just been marking bend lines, uh, but it does still have the stepper motor back there that runs back and forth. It's got uh, digital readouts, which helps set the depth control, and the other um, axis there is the back gauge running back and forth. It's got a custom control box over here. I say custom, I built it. Um, <coughs> this switch, uh, this, this button right here, uh, it, it has an automatic return. There's a foot switch on the ground that controls the ram and controls your stroke up and down. And if I hit this button, it will go down and when I release the foot pedal, it won't come back up. And if this switch is, if the knob is pushed out or pulled out there, um, once you let off the switch, it's, the ram is gonna go right back up. So if you're doing a bunch of parts, um, that's been really nice. It'll go down and then I just, I let it, um, you know, it's, it's working off of a limit switch here with a little threaded rod that I can adjust the depth. I do that ahead of time. I have my chart right here with each die and each, um, <coughs> or each different combination of tooling. I've got a chart set up here so that I know exactly how many degrees it will put in a bend of, you know, say 3 16 material with an inch and a half bottom die and a certain punch. Um, I'll know exactly what to set the depth at before I ever start doing it or before I ever start bending those parts. Say I want a 90 degree bend. I'll come over here and say, okay, 90 degrees. I'm gonna use this punch. I'm gonna use this die and it's a depth of 1.85 inches. So I'll set this to 1.85 and then I'll bend the material, measure it just to double check and then I can start bending all my other material as well if I've got you know, a, a small production run 
um, of parts there. And it's worked really good. Uh, I'll show you how it operates. It's got little linear guides. They're a little janky on the setup there, but um, they work fine just for keeping the plate from shifting back and forth. Uh, it um, has flow control, so this right here controls the hydraulics. I can just turn it to the left if I want it to slow it down, or I can turn it to the right if I want it to speed up. Um, there was you know, one bigger production run that I did of these brackets, and I just sat here in my, on a stool and put one in after another as fast as I could go, and it would just go down, come right back up, pull it out, put the next one in, go down. And uh, so that's when I speed it up. If I'm just bump bending something, I'll turn it down a little bit just so I can, you know, use my um, the digital angle finder here on a plate it's, if it's magnetized to the plate and stop it at a certain degree. That's usually if I'm doing weird, you know, strange angles that aren't a 45, a 90, you know, a 30 or 60 um, stuff that I don't already have, you know, recorded on this. Uh, and so that that's not that's been a nice feature, so I can control how fast it goes up and down. This one is new stop, kills the whole thing, kills power to everything. Um, so that will shut off all my hydraulics, it'll shut off the pump, it'll shut off the readout. If, if I have any electrical issues, I can hit that, it shuts the back gauge off, um, that kills all the power. Right here, you probably can hear it, that's the stepper. Um, that's the, it's moving a carriage back and forth on the back of the machine, I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, it doesn't have anything, again, it doesn't have anything attached to it. <coughs> um, this little knob right here controls the speed of the stepper. So I didn't want it just running full speed and just trying to bump it back and forth. And so it's a little potentiometer that I uh, wired in um, to the stepper controller. And uh, it works pretty good. So I can slow it down so it's just tiny increments. Um, and then this button right here, if I click it in, it allows it to come forward when I hit this, when I hit this button or if I hit, hit it the other way, it'll go the opposite direction. Right now, it's not really hooked up um, to the uh, readout here. That's because I took that back gauge apart. That was all built into it. Um, but the, it's, the mount and the bracket for it is still back there. So I'll show you that here. Uh, let me grab this. <coughs> so there is the uh, hoist pump, it's not leaking. I just moved my plasma table out of this corner last night and there was a puddle under it from cutting. Um, I'm able to produce uh, about 37 tons of pressure with this setup. Here is the stepper motor. No, it's not touching the wall either. There's a little space there. Uh, and this little block, let me hit the button here, goes back and forth. So you can see it there. I can speed it up or slow it way down so it's incremental, speed it up, or I can change the direction there and go back. Yeah, you speed it up, slow it down. This right here is the slide for the readout. Um, that's just sitting there for right now. Again, I had a big assembly back here for uh, back gauge, but I um, ended up taking it apart because I just I was planning on when I took it apart I was planning on building another one right away and I just never got around to it um, the dies and uh, punch are all easily removable um, it's just a couple of bolts that keep it in place and um, pinch it together it's really dirty right now you get some kind of weird reflections off of it it's more in the camera than in person um, it doesn't, I don't know why it looks like that right now. It doesn't look like that in person. Um, it's a 7 8 plate laminated with uh, 3 16 on both sides. And then it's got some shackles up above it. It's got like a 3 to 1 mechanical advantage uh, with that ram um, and the cantilever setup. <coughs> and um, it works pretty good. It, uh, you can adjust it for, for levelness. I know some other people have built like cantilever style press brakes and um, just you know home built units like this and uh, they had issues with it going down crooked and so I made it adjustable it's threaded so you can make fine adjustments to it if you're you know coming down if you're getting a two degree you know tighter on one side than the other um, you can you can adjust that and uh, that works pretty good um, it opens up a lot more than that as well right now it's about halfway down um, <coughs> The, oh, the ends are open, 
So I've got some tooling. Since it's a weird size, it's 40 inches across. You know, there's not a lot of 40 inch tooling. Um, you know, so I, I've got some longer tooling and I made it a kind of a pass through design so I can put my tooling in from the end. Uh, I've got one punch that's um, six foot and so I can push that through and uh, maybe it's, no, it's five foot. And I can push that through from the end and it rides up and down in the sides. You never see it uh, from the outside, um, but it kind of helps out on setup because I am limited uh, on you know, being able to offset it to the left or to the right um, like you would in a normal press brake that's open-ended anyway. Uh, <clears throat> the base for it is just on these uh, little beams with casters. Um, it moves around all right. It's definitely heavy. Um, the main structure, this is a 12-inch 12 e 12 beam inside, and then it's got... <laughs> Uh, 3 by 8 by 5 16 wall tubing uh, vertically placed within the beam itself all the way across on both sides and welded in. Uh, it's extremely solid. It's, I've, I built it as, as solid as I could um, and I uh, didn't want it to have any deflection which you know so far I haven't really I've been using it for a couple of years and haven't noticed any deflection at all, so I imagine it's, you know, overbuilt, um, but I didn't want to get done with it and wish that I, you know, had built it a little bit stronger. So uh, the, the reason that I use these beams and that tubing, that's kind of, you know, that's not something I would normally buy if I was going to build one of these, um, but uh, I, I found it for a really good deal online with all this heavy um, steel, and so I wanted to be able to use that. Um, to build this I want to be able to use that uh, to build this and so I kind of well not kind of I literally I designed it after I had the material already so I took my measurements all my material put it all into CAD and kept working on it until I figured out I could use every square inch of that material to make it as big as possible uh, and as strong as possible and then the only thing that I bought, the only steel that I bought brand new out of the entire thing um, was the 3 16 plates that I overlaid on the front and the back just to cover up some of the tubing and kind of tie it all together. Everything else I bought at one time, um, it was actually from someone, I, I drove out to Grand Rapids uh, and someone was selling a bunch of heavy steel out of their apartment complex garage. Um, and so I was able to get a really good deal on that, and I thought, you know, why not? I'll, I was just getting started with all this stuff and thought that uh, that sounded like a good option for me at the time. And it definitely was. It helped me a ton. It was definitely a good learning experience. Um, it's just time to move on. I got a bigger press uh, break coming in here in like four or five days. And so I'm going to sell this one, move the other one in here. I already moved the plasma table over there to make room for this over here. And I just wanted to make a video and show you guys how this whole thing works. All right, so real quick, um, I just put a new punch and die in, and uh, it's for three sixteenths. It's an inch and a half bottom die, and I'm going to come over here and set that for the first time. Um, I want to make sure it's all the way up. Okay.
real rough scrap piece, figure we'd give it a shot, see what we come up with. I'll bend it the other way, uh, just so you can see it snap a little bit. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions on it, feel free to leave those questions in the comments. I'll try to get back to each one that I can. Um, again, is it the absolute ideal press break? Probably not, but it's been working really good for me for the past couple of years. Now it's time to move on to bigger and better things. This one will be up for sale. If you're interested in it, let me know. I'm in Michigan. Um, and uh, we can get it loaded up for you.